and welcome to The Report, Cal State Fullerton's premier source for news, views, and info. I'm Brianna Beverly. I'm Ryan Matthey. I'm Jefferson Denham. And I'm Gabriela Martinez. We get started with our first hot topic. We'd like to invite you to be a part of the discussion. Click on the link in the description of any of our report episodes to fill out a secure Google form with your opinion on any controversial issue that we've talked about now or in the past. As many of these issues are recurring and evolving, we also have a Twitter account. Follow at the report CSUF to check out our polls, questions, and news updates. We begin today's episode with news on the Saudi oil strikes that took place over the weekend. CNN reporters that the coordinated strikes on key Saudi Arabian oil facilities have eliminated more than half of the country's oil capacity or about 5% of the daily global supply. These strikes have caused the biggest oil disruption in history, even surpassing the Iranian revolution. Yemeni Houthi rebels claim responsibility for these attacks. However, U.S. officials say the more likely culprit is either Iraq or Iran, as Saudi officials claim that Iranian weapons were found in the investigation. President Trump took to Twitter to claim that the U.S. is, quote, locked and loaded, depending on verification, end quote, to possibly respond to the Saudi Arabian strikes. As far as consumer implications, initially, prices spiked as much as 18%, but have steadied after Trump authorized the use of oil from the U.S.'s emergency supply as of Monday. U.S. oil futures jumped nearly 15%, whereas gasoline futures were up more than 13%. Experts say that consumers may notice a gasoline price increase in the near future. And let me tell you, I feel like we're almost feeling that effect right now, almost. We're getting, I'm driving past the gas station. My Arca, which I go to because I'm bombing on a budget and I'm trying to get that cheap of gas, it's, it's rising, it's getting higher. And so we're starting to feel these implications. So in terms of attacks or kind of retaliations to this, what do you guys think that we should be doing? I truly think that the escalation of the war would be a huge mistake, huge. I mean, this all comes from the Yemeni civil war. They should create a treaty of peace amongst themselves, but creating a war and causing more deaths, yeah. I do not agree. I mean, let's just think about the Iraq war. There are about more than 4,500 deaths. Yeah. Can we afford more of that? Mm. No. I don't think so. Well, I think yeah. Rand Paul even agrees with you, which I was kind of surprised uh, that here's a Republican congressman who usually, or senator who usually he agrees with everything the uh, administration says, typically. But he says, yeah, yeah do we really want to commit boots on the ground? Do people want to go through another war? And who's to say that by attacking them won't maybe right. spike other people to attack, maybe the same people, same actors, to attack other oil fields? Yeah, exactly. That is not the solution at all. No, it's I agree. Not. And, you know, I also feel it's probably now's the time uh, Ryan, you and I were talking about it earlier. Maybe now's the time to really dig in and try, try to figure out renewable energy so we're not always yeah. held hostage by what happens in the Middle East. Especially now since we're so, you know, we kind of live off of having oil for gas and like the prices going up, like you were saying, it's true. A lot of us are on a budget, you know, a lot of us are college students, you know, trying to have gas to come to school, you know, so the price of it going up so high is just, it's crazy. And to me, that's like something we need to change like now. Mm -hmm. And like you said, <laughs> Jefferson, sure. this is a perfect opportunity and a perfect example to kind of utilize now this yeah. reusable energy. That's first off, way more beneficial for the environment. Let's mm -hmm. just pretend yeah, like definitely. we care about the earth for a second. <laughs> and then on top of that, yeah, then we're not going to be so dependent on yeah. these, you know, out of state, out of country oil, you know, products and companies right. yeah. um, that this sort of situation doesn't happen anymore. And it's the technology of the future. Why don't we just get on that and lead the way? So next, we have an update from our ongoing story on Felicity Huffman's court sentencing following the major college admissions scandal. On Friday, September 13th, Huffman was sentenced to serve 14 days in prison, pay a $30,000 fine, and perform 250 hours of community service. This sentencing was handed down to Huffman in a federal court in Boston after she pled guilty to conspiracy to commit mail fraud and honest services mail fraud. Prosecutors recommended she spend one month in prison while her lawyers wanted her to serve for only one year on probation. The sentencing seems to meet each recommendation halfway. Huffman is due to report to prison on October 25th. Over the weekend, 76 anti-ICE protesters were arrested for blocking traffic in Manhattan. The protesters blocked the front of a Microsoft store, micro-demanding the company to stop allowing the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, to use their software. Stop the deportations! No borders! No nations! A little over a year ago, it was reported that Microsoft made a $19.4 million contract with ICE. 
Since creating the contract, Microsoft has released letters explaining their deal does not support the separating of immigrant children from their families. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella released a statement on LinkedIn stating, quote, our current cloud engagement with U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, is supporting legacy mail, calendar, messaging, and document management workloads, end quote. So in regards to protesting things like Microsoft, who is doing business for ICE, mm -hmm. um, I know we were talking a little bit earlier, but I do feel like for those who are not in power, which are the protesters, you are left with these kind of stunts and tactics because you cannot get, you're frustrated. You're so frustrated that you cannot get the government to listen to you. That's why the Tea Party was formed. That's why Occupy Wall Street was formed. And so you're trying to draw attention to a really ridiculous, horrible situation. A lot of those facilities were built for something like 200 people. Right. And you've got like thousands of people in these cramped facilities. It's ridiculous. It's horrible. It's inhumane. But... Microsoft is a company of immigrants in a nation of immigrants. And Adela openly mentioned, and she said, I want to be clear, Microsoft is not working with the U.S. government on any projects related to separating children mm -hmm. from their families at the border. So she's only helping, helping managing the workload, but she's not a part of this situation at all. Um, I think that many companies have been a part of inhumane acts in wars, in terrorist attacks, and that doesn't mean that there should be an issue with it at yeah, all. But if, so if, a, if a company like Microsoft is shown to, let's say, using your words, let's say they were shown to be doing business with a terrorist organization, right. what responsibility would Microsoft have there? Then they would have to work with that. They would have to deal with that. <laughs> they would but have what I'm to, trying to cut say is their that ties and get the hell out. They have nothing to do with it, though. Oh, I don't think. They, okay, you, it's like okay. if I Google something, and if I because I Googled yes. something and I organized a inhumane act. So now that they should um, sue Google. Or Actually, something like you know that? what? There that are, should be an issue. If you recall, the white supremacist who used social media to post their manifesto. Yes, they were kicked off. So I'm sorry, but Microsoft does have a responsibility to know what, who they're doing business with. And yes, what ICE does, whether or not you like what ICE does, maybe you do. Whether or not you like what ICE does, you have to admit that if you say I'm doing business with this company, you're going to get some of that rubbing off on you as well. And so for these people, I'm sorry, Ryan, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I get where both of you are coming from, where you're saying, well, obviously there is a human issue here, a human, like just putting people in cages, separating children from families, obviously very unethical. You have, you're saying businesses, it's not really their responsibility to do this, right? It kind of yeah. depends on who you're talking to. And I get where you're coming from saying, obviously they're a company, they're going to do what's in their best interest. And right. their best interest right yeah. now is keeping this data processing contract with ICE. But on the other side of this, this whole situation with separating people at the border, it's been related to what was happening at the Holocaust, where nobody was saying anything when uh, families and people were being separated from one another. Yeah. And right. because of that, obviously awful things happen. And so what's to say us not doing anything or Google not doing anything about yeah. it is going to prevent this from okay. happening again I in understand. the future? The U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Allergenic Products Advisory Committee voted last Friday in favor of approving a new treatment drug for peanut allergies in children. The drug Palfrazia is intended to lessen the severity of allergic reactions, such as anaphylaxis in kids from ages 4 to 17 with peanut allergies. If authorized, the drug will become the first FDA-approved treatment for the peanut allergy. For more on this story, we turn to CNN reporter Mandy Geither. This is uh, a breakthrough option for, for patients. For the first time, a peanut allergy treatment has been given initial approval by the Food and Drug Administration. The drug Palforzia is designed to lessen the severity of allergic reactions in people ages 4 to 17 who are allergic to peanuts. Peanut allergy is the scariest food allergy because you can't die from it. Dr. Jill Poole, a board-certified allergist at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, says this drug could help those 17 and under who are accidentally exposed to a small amount of peanuts. The maximum number of peanuts was, was small, like one to two peanuts. So this isn't being able to just go ahead and have peanut butter sandwiches or a, a bag of peanuts. Um, it still has to be well communicated 
that this isn't curing them of their peanut allergy. While Poole says this approval is exciting for patients, she says it'll involve a lot of preparation by allergists, something she's already working on. An advisory committee voted in favor for the treatment, but the FDA will make its final approval by January. The agency frequently follows the lead of the advisory committee. For today's Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. California Governor Gavin Newsom is cracking down on vaping. Governor Newsom took to the state capitol on Monday to announce a plan to spend $20 million on a vaping awareness campaign, which will educate the public on the dangers of vaping nicotine and other cannabis products. This campaign will also enforce stronger efforts to halt the sale of illicit products, particularly to minors, amid a vaping-related epidemic. While President Trump and New York Governor Andrew Cuomo have announced similar plans to ban the sale of flavored e-cigarettes, Newsom said he doesn't have the same executive authority. A governor alone is not afforded the right legally to ban those products outright that we would need legislative support. Having this epidemic, especially with y the younger people, the youth, I have, like, I, my brother's telling me, I have a brother who is a freshman in high school. He's telling me, yeah, first day, somebody just, like, offered me this doodad, and I didn't know what it was, and it was a vape pen. <laughs> oh and it's God. something that is being no. introduced to yeah. children so young nowadays. Obviously, you know, several years ago, we had cigarettes. Cigarettes was a big deal yeah. where, obviously, you saw your parents do it, but it wasn't something that you were going to do. Yeah. So mm -hmm. let me catch a cig behind the trash can or whatever, you know, people <laughs> did in high school back then. Yeah. But now it's kind of evolved into, it's not necessarily so hidden anymore. It's yeah. becoming more, I feel like, desensitized among the youth, where they see it as almost a toy almost. It's coming in, what, fruit flavors and candy yeah. flavors? It's so yeah. addicting and so welcoming. Mm -hmm to the youth, and I totally agree with Governor. It is, but a Irvington. campaign to create awareness is possibly not the answer, okay? No. Do you guys remember Reagan, the D.A.R.E. A campaign? Just say no. Okay, when I was in elementary school and then I was in junior <laughs> high, I would wear my cute shirt, and it worked, right? And I would wear my little bracelet, <laughs> yeah. and it, it was dandy. It really did. Elementary school, say no to drugs. That definitely right. worked. Yeah. Junior high, it worked. Um, but when we were in high school and college, does that campaign ring the bell? Does that help you? Yeah. I don't think so. $20 million, guys, $20 million that That's could possibly go into education. Yes, mm. I think we should invest our money wisely. Now, out of the 450 or so cases, I guess, that we're finding out about, mm -hmm. I think most of them are vape pens filled with THC, I think. Yeah, yeah. And so, and then, what, seven people have died? Yeah, around right. six, six or seven. Yeah. Six, six or seven people. I wonder how many people have died from cigarette smoking. Hmm, I wonder. Mm -hmm. So, to, to your point, just talking about it, I'm not sure that's going to do it. I think you're right as far as education. Definitely. I don't think a warning label, which I think New, uh, Governor Newsom is talking about, or you know, just reinforcing as best you can in public marketing. I don't think 20 million. First of all, it's, 20 million dollars is a lot, but I don't think in the sense. arena of marketing that's going to do anything. No, it's not. When there's about 40 percent of children in low social economical areas without arts and without classes to develop themselves in the arts. So I think that we should invest in education. And also um, adding on to what you were saying about how, yeah, this generation now, it's kind of like a normalized thing. People think, okay, well, I'm gonna go vape, or even just to chill, I think that's like, for me, that's something that has never been something that, you know, should have even been thought about. Like, why are you thinking, instead of chilling and, you know, vaping, go do homework, go outside, go, you know, don't be on your tablets all the, all the time, you know? Technology has really taken over as well, and for vaping, it's become a normalized thing, yeah. But the thing is, it's becoming normalized because maybe there isn't this huge presence yeah. of educational material telling them what the dangers of it is. There's obviously, again, as you've said, we had D.A.R.E. programs, we have Just Say No, we yeah, had yeah. all these things in the past that let us know, hey, yeah. maybe alcohol is not something that we should be misusing that often. Cigarettes, it can lead but to very happens. harmful things for your body, right? right? It happens. You're presented with this information saying, hey, this is what's going to happen if you do it. And then you're able to make your decision whether, you know, it turns out deathly or and not. And let me tell you a reason of why we don't have that anymore, why that's not being, you know, said to like students and all that. It's because technology has taken over. And even, you know, a lot of, you know, teachers and everyone use technology now, and it's kind of become something, again, normalization. It's normalizing. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, here's a real ringer of a story. San Diego and Jenna Evans had a bizarre dream that has turned into reality. Evans reported that, that she had a dream that she was on a hijacked train when her fiancé told her to swallow her engagement ring, which she designed herself when she woke up and was missing her ring. She knew exactly what she did with it. 
After rushing to urgent care and getting examined, the ring was in fact in her stomach. The doctors performed a small procedure and were able to safely retrieve the ring. As a precaution, Evan claims she now takes her ring off before bed. CNN reports that Evans and her fiance Bobby Howell will plan to wed next May. Congratulations. Well, here's hoping they washed off the ring before they put it back on. <laughs> hey, happy early Festivus, everyone. CNN recently reported that Netflix will be adding Seinfeld to their library. The streaming giant has acquired exclusive global streaming rights to one of the most popular sitcoms in television history for five years beginning in 2021. The financial terms of the deal struck with Seinfeld's distributor Sony Pictures Television has not been disclosed, but I bet you it's a lot. This licensing agreement follows the announcement of Netflix's loss of other popular sitcoms such as The Office and Friends, which will be heading to NBC Universal and Warner Media's respective streaming services in the near future. As major media companies are beginning to create their own streaming services, licensed content such as Seinfeld have become a major source of leverage for companies like Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon, who will still license content. And with that, that's all we have for this week. Have a great week, everyone, and stay tuned for more news, views, and info. I'm Brianna Beverly. I'm Ryan Matthew. I'm Jefferson Denham. And I'm Gabriela Martinez. Stay fresh, Fullerton.